Um, Hannah, over to you, and I look forward to the next uh, exciting hour of presentation. Fantastic. Thank you, Mark, and welcome, everyone. So I'm just going to uh, share my screen. I'm always nervous, but these things don't don't work perfectly, but I think we're I think we are good. We're in. So um, if you've been on the other webinars, you know the, the drill. There's a Q&A function down the bottom and also a chat functionality. So please, we're going to, um, I think some of the best conversations we've had throughout the last three webinars have been in that Q&A um, time. So I'm going to allow, as always, time for you to ask anything specific for me. So if anything's bottling up, please throw it down into that Q&A section or the chat and we'll go through those. Um, if you do have a question, please keep it as specific as possible so I can answer it directly to you. Um, so anything, the helpful things are if you're accommodation, a tour, an event or, or so on and so forth. So I can just give you exactly what you want. Otherwise, I can answer it in broad terms as well. So entirely up to you. So this is where we're at, webinar, webinar three, and we're looking at the reactivation phase. So what is marketing going to look like in this, in this post-COVID um, world, which we're, you know, fastly moving towards, which, which is exciting in a, in a tourism sense. So um, if you weren't here for the other two webinars, um, Donna has got the recordings and all of the slides. So please um, reach out to catch up on it. So we've been through a reset what the restart looks like, and now we're sort of moving towards the, the reactivation. And I think it's important to state that we're by no means into completely business as, as usual, as always, what I always caveat with is what the new, you know, it's not, we're not going to be back to business as usual as soon as everyone starts coming, we have to adopt to the new normal. So those are just things we have to, to work through. But I think we're sort of starting to move towards it's very much this, this third step. So if you weren't here for the other sessions, don't stress. It all um, the stuff that we're doing. A lot of it is based on repetitious marketing and getting the communication structures right. Because what we know about any sort of marketing is you need to talk to the customer really about seven or eight times with a similar message to get that cut through. So there's some things that we've discussed, and then I'm going to build some things on from our previous webinars. But don't worry if you if you haven't listened to them yet, you'll catch up as well. So. I guess the, the real topic that we're going to go through today is what does a post-COVID world look like and how do we market in it? So I really wanted to sort of start by looking at the customer sentiment um, and some of the challenges and some of the opportunities. Now, before I flip over to the next slide, I'm, I'm going to talk a lot about the challenges and I don't want you to get down, tune out straight away, you know, say, I'm not going to eat my lunch with Hannah anymore because they're amongst the challenges are opportunities. But I want to start with the challenges because I think a lot of the stuff we have been reading has been incredibly positive and I love the spin and I love the optimism, but I, I do think everyone needs to be uh, quite realistic. And, you know, as a small business owner myself, I have to be realistic and cautious and I don't think it hurts um, with any projections to err on the side of caution um, because, if anything above that will be better than, you know, perhaps over forecasting and being too optimistic and not, not quite achieving that. So some of the challenges we're seeing, and this is from a mixture of different tourism uh, research documents that I've, I've been reading and what the different um, government organisations have been putting out. So first one's a nice obvious one is most of Australia thinks there's going to be an economic recession coming out of this and finances are going to be quite tight for people. So this is a sentiment, it's a feeling as well as it is a reality for people. Lots of people have obviously lost, lost their jobs, had the cut downs, um, been stepped down, stood down hours, reduced, so on and so forth. So people's disposable income won't be what it was. Simple there. It's, you know, we will, we all know someone who's been affected significantly by this. In fact, most of us have been affected directly. So that's underpinning a lot of the motivations here. Um, we know baby boomers have been hit significantly on all fronts, whether they're a self-funded retiree or whether it was their superannuation. What we know is they're going to be trading down their holiday style. So uh, this is also an opportunity, I want to say that, is, you know, perhaps where people were, you know, the cruising elite or the people who, you know, always took the same holiday, but they're going to have to do it differently. So while this is a challenge, it is also an opportunity, but I'm really conscious for so many tourism businesses in the Murray River, that baby boomer target market is one of your core ones. So we can't ignore the fact that that is going to be significantly hit. Um, what we know is people have uh, said that they want to move to a simpler way of life. So 
Um, people are going to see things like premium and luxury products, tourism products, that, that's you, that's you as, as unnecessary, and a sort of move towards the basics. But this is an opportunity too, I want to say, is that, you know, we're going to see a revival of your things like camping, road trips, families, spending time together. So while a challenge, it's just an opportunity. Um, we know that tourism and travel sits atop every single sentiment report as the industry that will be the hardest hit and the one that will be cut first out of people's budgets. Again, that's a reality we, we, do, need to, we do need to live with. Um, and we know that travel privacy is going to um, sit atop people's motivations. And what I mean by travel privacy is that fear of proximity between people, the need to avoid crowded spaces, people will be going for country over city, um, and that's going to be really, really clear. We need to make that very clear in all of our messaging, which is something I've said in all three, three webinars so far. What we also know is that Australia is really divided. It's, it, all the stats are saying it's almost a 50-50 is once people can travel, will they want to travel? People haven't quite made their mind up there. So I've heard in, I do a lot of one-on -on work with operators and a lot of people have said, oh, you know, it's a bit of a build it and they will come straight away thing. But I think that's, it's not the right thinking is people don't, People are scared, people don't know what to do, and there's a lot of people who still sit in that high-risk category who are very concerned and just want to see what happens in terms of Australia's um, rollout. Will we get a relapse? Will we go back into lockdown? There's so many questions that are underpinning everyone's sentiment and their decision-making process at the moment. Um, what we know, and the one that I see as a real concern for a lot of tourism operators, is people will go for nature-based experiences, which, yes, is awesome. Yes, is fantastic for your destination, but most tourism operators I work with still have a bricks and mortar establishment. So yes, it's wonderful people will be coming to the region to say, walk through a national park or um, you know, take a boat out, but will they be then staying overnight in a bricks and mortar establishment? Will they then be having the dinner? You know, or will they just drive back home and take longer to do it? So they're the sorts of questions, you know, from a negative viewpoint that I that I want to start with. Um, I want to start to then look at the, the positives because I'm a very half, glass half full kind of person. So I want to start moving through those opportunities that we can then market to amongst it. One of my favorites, and I am totally biased when I say it as a digital marker, marketer is that baby boomers and silvers they have now taken up digital products which is so fantastic so you've got people like my grandma she's part of a um she's she's 83 she's part of a ukulele group and she's doing zoom she's zooming her group and this is something my grandma's never had anything to do with but she can now operate zoom she's also online shopping so what we're seeing is that people who've always been quite abhorrent and never really wanted to pick up digital tools well, they've had to through this and they've adopted really quickly. So from a marketing standpoint, what I love about this is one of our largest markets we've only ever been able to, to speak to and connect with through, um, through basically print methods, which are so, so expensive, we can now talk to digitally, which is a huge opportunity. What I also, I think is a huge opportunity and, and this stat just comes from New South Wales, but it's a very similar story in Victoria, is that New South Wales residents usually spend $16.7 billion of um, money overseas on leisure trips. But what they can do this year is they can spend it internally. Now, I think we need to be realistic. We're not expecting that full $16.7 billion to come back into, into the economy. Lots of people won't be taking holidays, but that's a great sign. This is a great opportunity in there. Um, what, I, what I think is one of the greatest opportunities we can look at at the moment is looking at what's happening overseas. So if we look at China, what we saw there is it was the young who got ready to travel first. So regardless of who your current or what you would have said was your target market, in a post-COVID world, we need to think younger as well because they're going to be the people who are going to travel first because they have the least health concerns and the less sentiment around that, that privacy and proximity piece. I love that people will be not doing these long haul holidays. They won't be going to Italy for the break. They'll do micro holidays. And this is a great opportunity for us. So we'll see short breaks rise, which is good for destinations like the Murray River, which is sort of a, you know, really specialise in that two, three night away kind of category. I think that it's a huge opportunity that international travel has a long lead to recovery. We've got 12 months what they're saying is 12 months of no international flights, more or less, which is 12 months of domestic opportunity sitting there. Of course, we, you know, it, it might come back faster, but, and we shouldn't 
you know, sit on our laurels thinking we've got this for 12 months, but we could have potentially this long an opportunity just to keep people domestically, which we've never had this kind of opportunity before. In, in New South Wales and Victoria, you're in a box seat because interstate travel makes up a significant portion of your current uh, national visitor, um, your NVS surveys and, and the amount of visitor nights that you have. So in Queensland, WA, South Australia, they're in a position where interstate doesn't make up most of their portion of travel. It's, it's, in, it's interstate. And so in Queensland, where, where I'm recording from, people can't cross the border. So the tourism industry is really screaming at the moment because we need that. You know, Port Douglas needs the Victorians escaping winter. So you're in a good position in that your, your rules and your regs are, are, are set up um, or the restrictions as they are, you know, you can criticize them or there's lots of things that aren't great about them. However, we are in a good, there's some opportunities within that as well. Um, one that it, it, it's speculative, but I like it is that, you know, with the reduction of, of the flights, what we're going to see is that people are going to take more long haul road trips. So um, instead of say flying to, you know, Melbourne, Sydney, Adelaide, maybe people will start to drive. And so then we've got this opportunity for Murray River to become the overnight stop along the journey there. So a lot of opportunities sitting sitting within there that I think we can really play to in our marketing piece. And I think just keeping your ear to the ground with what customers are feeling amongst that doom and gloom of it, we can see, we can see the silver linings to be able to speak to. So I think um, one of the things that, that's quite interesting, and I was having a great chat with Mark yesterday about it, is the, the recent tourism research has said we are on a long road to recovery. And just, I think, to be realistic about what that road to recovery might look like for your business and everyone will be completely different. Um, we're sort of looking at to get back to normal, so to speak, or back to 2019 figures, that the current estimations are sitting at five years, which is um, which is a scary thought. Um, but I think it's some, it's good to be realistic and to have um, to have that worst case scenario in, in, in your head of what it will look like. So what the current economists are saying for the tourism industry is that for the 2021 year, the financial year we're about to move in, it could be anywhere from still a 40 to 50% downturn. Um, so just something to keep absolutely in the back of your minds that that is of course a generalized statement. It's something that is taken across the board for the tourism industry. So it obviously takes in every tourism operator in Australia. You can sometimes take stats with a grain of salt, but I think it is important in this case to look at what that what they are saying is that although amongst the optimism and amongst the, the opportunities, the reality is, is that the, the travel won't be coming back to normal as we knew it, at least not for straight away. So if we're looking at that five year mark, we'll start to see that those numbers back around the 2023 mark. So that is obviously an incredibly long way off. And I don't, um, I don't want to downplay it or underplay it because that's very significant to people's um, the way they do business and the way they'll go about marketing. So um, what we can do is what we know is we can attract people, we can get people back and we can try and capitalize on it and, and prove these stats wrong. That's the best off. That's the best case scenario we can do here. We hope it doesn't look like this, but I think a dose um, or a consideration of reality or, or what they're saying is always good um, to just sort of underpin and caveat all of your plans. So how do we approach all of this? We need to take into account the fact that people are financially stressed. We know that people won't be going for those kinds of experiential things. It'll be, we'll see that return to basics and we'll see that younger people will travel first. So my biggest question and one of the things I wanna get through today's session is what are we doing to attract these younger people? Because a lot of people, um, a lot of tourism operators I work with always say, no, it's the younger market, they're not, they're not my core market. And that, that might be fine, but they have to be now. And if you're not sure how to connect with this younger market, I would strongly recommend you speak to someone younger to help work out a way that you can connect with them. So um, I've got a, a blog post with a link here about how to market to millennials. And you know, I get it, I am a millennial and everyone hates millennials, but they're a $3.8 trillion industry. It can't afford not to market to them. So, and particularly come, coming out of this is they'll be the first people to travel. It's about adjusting your messaging, adjusting your offering, and just adjusting how you do things to try and tap into this market. So I want to work, walk us through how do we stand out through all of this? How do we tell our story? And anyone who's done any of my sessions know that storytelling is my absolute passion point because this is how we build um, that 
that really strong connection with the customer. And what we know and what we know from our own brands that we love and we follow is when we trust a brand, we can drive a transaction. Seth Godin, who is the greatest marketing god of all time, he's written a bunch of, of books. And if, you, and if you do have any time, I strongly recommend you, you buy and read any of them. They're an absolute undergraduate degree in marketing within 130 pages. Incredible reading. And it comes down to marketing is no longer about the stuff you, you make, but the stories you tell. And that's really how I see our, where I see our opportunities moving out of this. So storytelling is really simple. Um, it's one of the most convoluted areas of marketing. People really overcook it, but it really just makes, uh, it really comes down to making your customer the hero of the story and it becoming less about you. And as we move out of post COVID world, that's what this is going to be about is we have to put ourselves in our customer's sh shoes and show that we care, show that we can connect. Where stories are so powerful is that they tell real stories and real people connect with real people. So that's how you build that trust. Brand stories should be told with personality because we know what we know about personalities is we fall in love with them and we can connect with them. We just can't connect with, with sales and, and numbers and, and discounts and deals and things like that. So telling the Murray River story is going to be so important as, as we move through this. So I want to walk you through um, the seven steps for story selling. So this is telling stories that drive sales. So there is another book I would strongly recommend if you want to read more about this by Donald Miller. It's called, his book is um, called Telling Your Brand Story. And that's pretty much what the 200 pages covers. So every single story, every single movie, every single um, piece of incredible brand work that you've ever seen only has seven steps. So you've got a character who has a problem who meets a guide, who gives them a plan, calls them to action. The action helps them avoid failure and it all ends in success. So if anyone's seen The Hunger Games, you can see it absolutely fits into this, into this um, basically category. Harry Potter, exactly the same. Born Identity, you know, Mission Impossible, any of these, any movie that you like, you can run it through this exact, um, this exact formula. So what does that look like for you? How does this apply in a post-COVID world? So... Your character is your audience. They have a problem. They have been stuck inside for COVID-19 and they've got a terrible case of cabin fever. Who meets a guide? That's you. That If you're an accommodation operator, that's you. If you're a tour guide, that's you. If it's a Murray River Tourism organization, that's you. So it does, it can be applied at any different level. Who gives them a plan? Your plan is to escape your four walls, to relax, to take it slow, to holiday safe, to, to calm down. Whatever it is that solves that problem, that's what you're about to give them. You're going to give them that action plan. You're going to call them to action because a plan without giving them something to do, is, is it's just a dream. So you're going to give them an action to book a holiday with you somewhere where the air is clean. So depending on what the problem is or what you identify for your target market, that's how your call to action will answer to that. It's going to help them avoid failure. They're not going to get sick. They're not going to have to join the crowds. They're not going to have to spend a lot of money. So you, to help them avoid failure is going to speak to whatever their problem is, whatever their motivation is that you choose as part of this marketing story. And that ends in, store, in, in success. So if they find inner peace or they realize there's no place like holidaying at home. So you can adjust these steps and these frameworks and you will be getting a copy of the slides to fit and plug and play all of uh, your exact audience, what you think their, their problem is and how you can help. And you can just run this on repeat, whether that's in a social media post, whether it's how you structure your website, whether it's how you send your next email. This storytelling method works in every single type of marketing that you do. It can even work for exactly how you greet and meet and greet your, your customers as they arrive at your property. It's, it's, a, it's a very simple framework that can be applied. So how does it come to life? So the first thing I want you to do is think about your audience. And if you've got a marketing plan, you've probably done this a thousand times is defining your target audience. But I've been working with people over COVID-19 and no one's got the same audience as they did before COVID-19. So it's going to be so important that you spend your time redefining the new audience because what I've said at the start is that the younger people will be traveling first. So these people, these are people who you probably never had in your marketing plan. You could rely on the gray nomads, the caravanners, the what have you. 
But if we've said we've got younger people traveling or we've got young families or the way they're traveling is different, well, we need a new audience document. We need to define our target audience. So these are some questions and I do have a full guide available on my website and also a blog post. And if you also type into Google at any point how to define my target audience, there's no end of resources about it. Um, so these are the kinds of questions to ask is my product or event is for people who blah, blah, blah. My product service or event is for people who do not, because I think that's just as important is to find out what people don't like about your product, find out why they don't buy your product. What are customers and, and their friends going to tell each other about your product? What are they afraid of? What are they short on? So is it, is it, is it money? Is it time? Is it, is it um, quality time? You know, get really specific. And what are your customers frustrated by? And, and, and work out that so you know exactly who's coming and what motivates them. More than ever, you need to think this through through the lens of the customer because they could be feeling grief, they could be impacted, they could be anxious, uncertain, stress bored. Equally, they could be grateful, they could be optimistic. We don't know exactly how your customers are going to feel right now. So you need to paint these audience personas. And I've worked with a couple of businesses at the moment who have different ones depending on whether the customer was affected. You know, my business was terribly affected by COVID-19. But conversely, my partner hasn't been affected whatsoever. So that's quite interesting because this industry is completely different. So he would get a different customer persona if we were attracting um, our, our exact relationship to this, to a product. So um, using things, uh, words that, you know, or phrases like, you know, we understand how you feel when or we, un we know because we were affected by this too. It, it shows that you care. It gets that empathy across if you're speaking to those people who were affected or impacted. What motivations are people going to be um, be powered by? And this is where we can talk to those things, um, those, those sentiment things, is we know people are going to be affected by cleanliness, safety, security, access, affordability. We know they're powered by um, nature experiences. They also have spent a lot of time in isolation, so they don't want isolation, but equally they do want to be isolated because they don't want people. So there's a, there's a fun one to, to sort of play with, you know, isolating the right way. Um, people want pay. People, some people want pace and some people don't want pace in their holiday. They want to do slow travel. They don't want to return to normal. They don't want to be frantic. Maybe it's something else. So when you connect with people on this emotional level, you start to connect like a human, not like a brand. And that's where you can get those real sales gains is people buy from people. They don't buy from brands. So that's, that's sort of your magic. That's your sweet spot when it comes to marketing is to absolutely get super clear on these motivations. So how are you going to solve the problem when we're moving down this seven step um, pyramid? How, how do you, the guide, solve their problem? Well, to do that, you need to be really clear on your unique selling point and what sets you apart. And if there's ever been a time to get crystal clear on it, it's now. And I've just been getting harder and harder on my position with this, with, with, with um, people I'm doing one-on-ones, because if you don't know and you can't explain it, how will a customer know what your USP is. So if you don't know and you're still struggling, please get some help. There's heaps of branding experts who will, who will be able to tell you exactly what your USP is and now it's you can get that elevator pitch or that elevator script to be able to just spit it out when people ask because it's we're sort of at a point now where we're going to be competing for a smaller share of the market. Having your USP and what sets you apart crystal clear is going to be really the foundation work for, for what success looks like for you. So what are you going to ask them to do? So how, how, once you're the guide and you're going to offer them, um, offer them a plan that leads them to success, how are you going to do it? What are you going to ask them to do? What's your offer? So I don't mean offer as in discount. I mean, is it to book a holiday? Is it to take a tour? Is it to take a long drive? Is it just to, you know, take a walk nearby? Is it to go outside? So how can you help? How can you put yourself into the customer's story? So by now we're right at the end of the, those seven steps um, that I ran through because it's important that you only place yourself back into the story with your sales tactic right at the end. You've just been about helping your customer to this point. And more importantly, how can you specifically solve that pain point that we talked about before? So what are you going to ask your customers to do?
And then what does your happily ever after look like? What, what is that magic moment that the customer gets when they come and stay with you or they, they take your tour or they book a wedding with you? What's that happily ever after? What does that look like? So how are you then going to show this? Is it videos? Is it, is it still images? Is it words? What's your tactic there? How, how does that come to life? So they're the sorts of questions I want you to, to ask yourself as you're working through this plan. So I hope that makes sense as the seven steps. And as I said, you've got, we're getting the copy of the slides, so you'll be able to run through those yourself. One of the questions that I didn't get to answer um, last week that I wanted to, to spend a bit of time on today um, was someone who asked, how's the best way to capitalise on people's desire to travel? And I wanted to spend a little time here just talking about websites. Um, I think that websites are one of these topics that you can never have enough information on. Um, so please, there might be some things that you do know, some things that you don't know um, about, about websites, but since they are our single biggest um, marketing tool, I think it doesn't hurt to, to focus on them for a bit. So my first recommendation to get more people to come is to update your ATDW listing. If you're not familiar with the ATDW, it is the Australian Tourism Data Warehouse. It is the oracle of tourism in Australia. And when you upload your listing into it, it gets published across 600 websites, including Tourism Australia's and also obviously the Murray Rivers as well. Why this is important is it is SEO gold. Firstly, you've got 600 backlinks. That is just absolute wizardry for your website. But secondly, why it's important is your uh, membership is free this year. So please, if you haven't done it and you haven't and you haven't done it in the past because of price, price is being taken away from the equation this year. So please, please, please put your, your details in there. And if you need assistance, um, Mark and Donna will be able to connect you with the right people. Um, there, no one will defend the ATDW. It is a clunky system in terms of the upload process, but it is the best we have and it is really, really effective. So please do that. The second thing I'm going to ask you to do is to fix your website. And the reason your website is so important is that it promotes you 24 seven and no employees, bless their cotton socks, are going to do that for you. So it has to be working for you round the clock. So some basic website updates to do and things to check off that you're currently doing is firstly checking is what you do above the fold. Remember in old newspaper um, uh, days, basically there was a fold when it was broadsheet style and the paper would be folded over. If it was above the fold, that's what people saw when they were walking past or picking it up. That's your front page news. So many tourism operators I work with do not put what they do or do not make it clear what they are above the fold, or they use very fancy, complicated language to that describes something that I do not understand what it is or how I can experience it. So put all of that in simple layman's terms above the fold. What you need to then do is clean it up. There's so many websites out there and tourism operators are some of the worst offenders I see because I think they've got so much imagery and so much stuff going on and they want to show everything that they can do that they put everything into the website. And it, well, firstly, technically it makes the website really heavy, but secondly, it doesn't funnel people towards what you want them to do, which is to purchase. So we need to make the purchase button so, so clear. Put your cash register where people can see it. We should absolutely know at all times where to put the money. Money, where to put the credit card details. A thing to fix at the moment is removing your COVID pop-up updates. And when this all started happening, we all contacted our web developers, which was the absolute right thing to do was to get our COVID message to blast out and usually in bright green or bright yellow and very aggressively. But things have changed, restrictions have moved, and most people haven't actually removed their COVID update absolutely have a plan, put it somewhere, put it in a link, uh, particularly if you've got your, so your COVID safe plan, you want to publish that, put that somewhere. But that doesn't need to be the thing that springs forth at people because it's quite aggressive and it also can be quite scary. And my other tip to check off is check your opening hours. And I know I said it last week and I know I said it the week before, but I'm still seeing tourism operators with the wrong opening hours on their website, which just makes it so hard. I know we're doing a couple of campaigns at the moment for people and we're using people's websites to find out if they're open or not. And we're moving so quickly. We're not giving people phone calls to see if they're awake. Honestly, if their website hasn't been up to date, we've moved on and just assumed they're still shut. So I just hate for um, people to be making those kinds of assumptions about your business because you haven't updated your website. So how do you receive more bookings to a website? This was a question that came through last week. 
And that really, to me, comes down to usability. What you want to do is make sure that it is front and centre how people can buy and book your product. You only need to look at the big players, and I always, I always recommend people look at the big players because I think often people they spend time looking at their, their competitor set internally or in a small business sense. Look at the big guys because they have the best in the business building their websites. Every single big hotel brand will stick on their homepage the, a massive above the fold, how to book, what dates do you want and a book now button. That's the sort of replication that we need to see across people's websites to make it absolutely crystal clear how people can book and purchase. Um, I think getting a bit fancy with how you do your keywords and getting your um, SEO done on your website is absolutely critical. Using your website's copy to rank in Google, using your image descriptions, page descriptions, getting an SEO specialist, even if it's just for a once off foundation, tidy up, get Google, you, you've, you've got Google there, like get it working for you. It's almost like, uh, I see SEO as almost like a passive income stream is your website and Google is, should be working for you as hard as any of your employees. And so many people don't make it work for them because they haven't set it up correctly or they don't have the expertise. And SEO is a very dark arts kind of area in that, you know, you're buying hours, you don't know whether it works, it pays off in the long run, you're not going to see gains immediately. But you do need to get these search engines able to find you. It's critical. Some things to tick off. Um, does your website have good usability? If you don't, if you don't know if it does, please get someone else, someone you trust to, to check it off. I believe OTAs work so well because they're usable. That's why people choose booking.com over your website a lot of the time. If they can find it, they're familiar with it, they know how to use it. Lots of people's websites that or their online booking systems are so convoluted that people just go for the easier option. Is it clear from the second people land that they know what they're meant to do? Is, are your contact details everywhere? Are your prices clear and transparent? That is one of the most, and I understand you've got, you know, scalable pricing structures and things like that in your business, but you've got to make it clear somewhere what, what the price is. Does your website incorporate testimonials? Better yet, put a third party integration in because obviously if you hop onto my website, of course I've only got the glowing reviews that we've got. But if you hop onto Google, you'll get a much better idea of, of, of what we're like to work with. Um, five stars if anyone's currently Googling us. Um, and then use your SEO and your search words to tap into those websites and help customers with those pain points as well. So I want to talk about SEO for a little bit and the text on your website. I'm sorry that is a bit blurry, but the most valuable asset on your website is the text on your pages. And the reason for that is content is king and Google is only smart enough still to read words. So if you're not familiar with how Google works, this kind of this is this is how it essentially works and it, and it happens in 0.03 of a second. So the customer searches for a specific word. So they type in Murray River tourism or I, holiday to the Murray River. That's probably what they'd search. A Google spider or a Google bot then goes and it searches and it's looking for every time or keyword that says holiday in Murray River has ever been put on your website. Basically, it then catalogs them according to what, how many times you've used that keyword, and that's how it forms its ranking. The person who said it the most rises to the top, and that's how the search results page of Google is powered. And that all happens in 0.03 seconds. It's incredibly powerful, but that is why your keywords and the words you put on your website are absolutely critical. And yet so many people don't spend the time on them or don't do the keyword research to find what people are looking for. So I wanted to take you through two tools that I find really important for this. And one is Google AdWords. So it is a, um, let me get my little mouse up so you can see. Um, so you're looking for Google Ads Keyword Planner. Um, if you get in, so this is the link here, which you can do it, do at home. You're looking to discover new keywords here. What you can then do is type in what you're looking for down here. So um, you can put search words and you have to use a sort of like a, your, your brain and, and how you think people would find you. What are the, those sorts of search words? They're probably not going to search for your property name. So of course your property name is always going to come as up first. So, you know, in the case of my business, someone types in media mortar into Google, of course we come up, but I want to win the work when people don't know who we are. That's the, that's the race to really win. I want to win content marketing agency tourism. That's what people are searching for. And 
I want to beat out my competitors at that race because if you've already got my brand name, chances are you already know who I am. Someone's referred me. Uh, you probably think I'm okay at what I do. So you're going to come to me. You know, my conversion rate's a lot higher. I want the people who don't know about me. So this is the way you do it. So um, Google ads there, discover new keywords and then experiment with some of those words you can put in there. So this is what the screen that will then come up. So I can see Murray River, I can see how many average monthly searches come through and I can see the competition is low. So this is a great one because it's got very high search traffic. That is great search traffic for a region. And the best bit is competition is low, which means if you start using this more and more, your chances of being picked up and being put to the top is incredibly high. What we also know is over here, if you see these prices, this is if you want to do search engine marketing. So that's if you want to bid to be on the top page of Google, which is when you see that little thing ad. Those are the prices per click. So if someone, if you pay for an ad, you'll be paying anywhere between $1.03 and $4.41 and to be the top of Murray River if you wanted to do that. So that's how, how that works and how you can come up with your keywords for, um, for your website. But you've got a copy, you'll get a copy of the slide. So I encourage you to experiment with this. And if you've got any questions, please let me know. The other tool that I find incredibly interesting, and I use this one a lot for even social media planning, is one called Google Trends. So this is free. It's much easier to find and navigate than Google AdWords. And it tells you what's trending in Google around the world. And where I find this interesting and how you can use this really, really well to your advantage is you can see what makes people tick or what are their concerns. These are literally their pain points. So in Australia at the moment, on the topic of coronavirus, these are the top five things that people are searching. So Blackwater coronavirus, so that's um, up here in Queensland. There was a nurse who was, who was sick and then it was, you know, someone died in Blackwater and allegedly uh, she passed it on, but it came out yesterday that um, the person was, was not connected. Um, so that's quite interesting. 30-year-old um, coronavirus, so on and so forth. So that's quite interesting as a tool. What I love about it is, um, so you can search what Australians are traveling for, oh sorry, what Australians are searching for, um, and all of their different, you can, you can type in different things, like you type holidays, you could type travel, you could type Mother's Day, you can type whatever interest group that you're, you're, you're looking for. But what's also interesting is you can toggle it and look for what people internationally are searching for. And where this is kind of interesting is we start to get a better picture about what the sentiment is even internationally. So what I like um, as an example is I looked at um, the United States. Um, you can also change it from the past 12 months or I did um, this is their top five searches and I changed that to last seven days, but you can even do it down to the last four hours. So obviously protests are big, but I, I like that people are concerned about coronavirus and protests. So that's, that's sort of combined there. So you get a sense of that. Um, I checked Italy as well. So um, the first one is about um, uh, lung transplants with coronavirus. So that's their, their top trending. This is uh, Daily News, coronavirus to June, coronavirus one June, so on and so forth. So it's interesting you get to see well, internationally what are people searching for because you can sometimes borrow concepts or borrow ideas by countries that are perhaps more advanced or perhaps further behind with what, what are their motivations. So you can get really clear sentiment report. It's almost like a DIY sentiment report of the whole world right now with coronavirus, which I think is, is really interesting. I always push for blogs, keywords, and, and copywriting on the website, not because I'm a copywriter. I need to stress that. It's for these reasons. You've got five core reasons. It attracts more search traffic to your website. You get to become an authority on the subject matter. People will spend more time on your page, and Pete, you'll create more opportunities for yourself out of it. And fifthly, you'll stand out. But you get to build trust when people spend more time with you. And when you buy, build trust, you can sell to people. And this is where it becomes so important to get this, this stuff absolutely right. It's not pushing my own agenda here at all. We just want to get more people to your website to be able to sell more to them, essentially. So some blog ideas or content ideas. 
um, that'll be really relevant to get out right now. 10 things to do in, in your town, X reasons why you should take a holiday to your region, X wilderness walks to take in. With wilderness walks, I'd be really pumping that proximity thing. Um, X day trips from your capital city, because we know people aren't coming necessarily for these long stays yet. They want to tip their toe in the water. X restaurants open for dine-in meals, if you've got some in your, in your region or your town, uh, road trips to take this winter. So making things nice and specific there. I wanted to walk you through, just before I throw over to questions, what other people are up to, because this is one of, I think, one of the things that we've got the most value out of in, in the last um, few sessions. And I am loving everyone's putting out their, their campaigns at the moment. So I wanted to give you a bit of a best of the world, what are people up to? This is my favourite. This is Tourism Dunedin's post-COVID campaign. It's called a pretty good plan D. So um, tapping into the fact that you can't go overseas, they've made some really cheeky, uh, it's print, digital and TV. Um, I love it. It's like Bali, but with wetsuits. The vision, the imagery is so incredibly strong. It's got amazing taglines. Um, a location um, finder at the bottom, very clear, very punchy, very cheeky, um, very strong campaign um, from me. Uh, Love New South Wales has come out, so there's a link there to watch it um, in your own time. You, you might have already seen it, so print digital um, TV again. A beautiful hype reel of the best of, of de um, Destination New South Wales. Um, really lovely, lovely campaign that's been put out this, this week. Um, Tourism WA, it's got a, an operator sort of campaign and then they've got another one. So this, this was their first um, bite at it, was do it in WA, so it was... Um, uh, basically getting people to, to roll their pictures onto um, that hashtag and it was about holidaying closer to home. And then they've sort of formalised the offering, I guess, in the last two days um, to um, this one, uh, Wander Out Yonder, which I absolutely love. And the out, if you see it in visual, it's the O and the T move apart. So it's got almost a social distancing message there. So we're free to wander out yonder. So that goes, um, that's just intrastate WA and getting people um, to holiday closer at home, which is lovely. SATC, so South Australian Tourism Commission, has gone out with Love Where You Live, so a very similar sort of campaign. We've got the different locations um, with a call to action um, to holiday closer to home. Gold Coast has got come out and play again, so again kind of drops in afterwards. Um, it's, a, it's a lovely little video. It's all based on um, a They've got some stock footage, but then they have some just, it's shot on iPhone um, vertical of some of the cool takeaway options that they've got at the moment and how people have been isolating. And it sort of opens with this beautiful scene of uh, a man waxing his surfboard in a garage. And it's sort of like saying that we've been getting things ready for you. It's, it's a lovely little message, a great video. So I've put, put the link there. Some overseas examples, and, and these are just, um, I think, just sort of thought starters for the way the rest of the world's dealing with it. So uh, Visit Vienna is looking at um, anyone who pays 190 euros to get uh, temperature tested as they come into Vienna to skip quarantine. Importantly, that is only if you are a citizen, but I think it's a interesting approach to how they're looking at international travel over there is, um, you know, to avoid that quarantine, you get a test at the airport, pay for it. It's a pay-to-play scheme. So that's, um, you know, I think of interest. Um, Visit Cancun, they have a big marketing campaign um, behind um, attracting visitors with two-for-one hotel stays. So they've got a deal. It's at a, um, it's at like a, I guess, a DMO level. So your destination marketing organization level is are the ones doing a subsidy scheme. You've probably seen, um, there was a lot of stuff in the news this week about Japan is going to pay for you to get there. And it turned out that it was all not correct. Um, but again, it was a stimulus style package, which is the way some people are going down this route. Um, Sicily's got 75 million euros to play at this and they've got an initiative which may pay, the tourism board may pay for one night of your three night stay in Sicily, which is interesting and, and good luck, good luck to Italy with their recovery because that is going to be incredibly difficult um, for them in particular. So what's Murray River Tourism up to? Well, I can't exactly say, but my um, my agency, I'm really excited. We are working with Mark and Donna and we have something very in the lines of what everyone else is doing and what I always, I talk about, which is storytelling and ground up approach and getting everyone inclusive. We have a campaign that will be going out to the LGAs and operators and visitors and encouraging them to send love from the Murray. So tying into what Destination New South Wales is doing and also what Tourism Australia is doing with their with their live, um, their live campaign, sorry, and holiday here. 
this year campaign. So please stay tuned for details. It will be coming out. We'll have um, toolboxes and toolkits so that you can incorporate the campaign messaging into, um, into your social media channels, into your e-newsletters, across your website if you would like to. Um, you'll get a DIY kit which will have caption thought starters along with um, the creative tiles that you can, um, you can drop your own content into. So we're looking at working with Canva on that so it's nice and easy, no Photoshop skills required. So that is um, just in the works um, and that will be coming out soon and we're very, very excited to be to be leading that and running that with with Donna and Mark to get that that into into motion for everyone. So um, that's what the, the Murray River is up to and it sort of gives you a bit of a snapshot of the, the tone and the direction that pretty much everyone around the world is taking. It's a very, um, everyone's got the same message, which is holiday close, closer to home. So it's, it's comforting that we're all playing in the right space and we've got the right messaging um, coming out. So I wanted to kick over to, to questions because I've seen a couple come through. Um, I might just stop, stop this share and jump in because I can see, um, see a couple come in. Um, Oh, I see someone's like, yahoo, ATDW is getting some changes. <laughs> yep, that is <laughs> very exciting indeed. Um, so what have I got here? Uh, if I'm involving other businesses in my video clips, what is the best way to launch them? Just link them on my Facebook and other platforms and tag them or send them a link and ask them to post it as well if they're be if they're willing. So when it comes to videos, um, if you've got other people involved in, in your video, the best way for someone else to share it is if you share them a native file. So I'm presuming you've made a video, there's a couple of other people in it. Um, you want them to share it on say their Facebook, um, uh, maybe their website. What you should do is give them the MP4 file via a Dropbox or a file transfer service and get them to share it. Because if you share the, the YouTube link, when they share it on their Facebook, it just won't get the same engagement. Um, so always with social media, upload natively where possible. So that's what I would recommend you do. When you share it on your Facebook post, you share it natively yourself and you can tag them in it. But I would get them to share it as if it was their own post there. Um, and they will also, um, the best way to ensure that you get tagged back is to write the caption for them. So as you know, a time poor business owner, if someone says, Hannah, can you share this and, and sends me some suggested wording? I almost nine times out of 10 take it because I'm like, oh, thank goodness someone's done the heavy lifting for me. So that will ensure that you get your tag back in there and you're included. Um, so I hope that answers that, that question. Um, someone has asked when I use hashtags, I, um, I choose those that I feel are most useful, but I also love to have shares and wider exposure. Any suggestions? Oh, I have so many suggestions on hashtags. So I, um, hashtags are one of the most, um, it's, it's my most asked question. So, um, what I would recommend you do, um, is you create a, um, a hashtag bank of all the relevant hashtags that you use for your region and what your, um, what those larger organizations are that you would like to share from. So let's say it's, it's Murray River Tourism using hashtag visit the Murray as one. If you want, um, you know, uh, Tourism Australia, hashtag see Australia and, and create those banks um, and then use those, save them down as say notes on your phone or um, on your scheduling platform of, of choice, save it down so that you can just copy and paste them onto all of those, um, all of those posts that you're doing. Um, and I see you're also, you've said that you're contacting local businesses and saying you're posting about them, which, which is a great step as well. So one of the things I find um, for a couple of the small businesses that we say run their social media, it can be quite frustrating because we're always tagging in other people and they don't run social media accounts themselves. And I often feel like, oh, we've got, we're always tagging you and you're not um, sort of maximizing th this opportunity, maybe just connecting them and just saying, hey, I know you don't do your, your face, you haven't, I've noticed you haven't touched your Facebook and Instagram for a really long time. Is there a reason why? Do you need some resources on it? Here's, here's some places to look. Because I think a lot of people don't, um, a lot of small businesses, um, they, they just don't know what, what to do. So they do nothing. And that sort of inertia is even worse. So maybe if, if you're, um, you know, a real gun at this, and it sounds like you are, because you, you're asking the right questions, if you've got some knowledge, why not um, share or, or tell them where you found your information to get started. And, you know, there's heaps of social media books and, and resources out there that can help, um, help you find, um, I guess, 
basically help them get on their way. So that, that would be my answer to that, to that question there. Um, someone has asked, how did I find that Google search traffic again? So there's a link in the slides, but it's ads.google.com and you're looking for keyword planner. I've got to tell you, it is buried. It is absolutely buried and Google makes it hard to find because they don't want you to find it. They want someone, they want you to pay for SEM, which is search engine marketing. So a bit like anyone. And I'd love to know in the chat if you, um, if you try, had a go at doing your acquisition campaign and you got into ads manager last week because it's very similar to that situation um, they make it hard to find because they can <laughs> and that's you know I, I guess I would too if I was Google you know they want you to spend spend money so um, if you if you do need any help just reach out and, and I can send you send you the link but it is in the in the PowerPoint PowerPoint slides does anyone have any um, any more questions? I've been through the, the Q&A, the ones that have, have dropped there. Oh, do I feel like there's a best time of day to post? So um, this question came up, I think might have been last week or the first one. So absolutely, I can tell you when I think is the, the best time to post, but the best time, the best person to check is actually you because in Instagram, in the business setting, if you have a business account, you can go into, there's three little stripes at the top in the top right hand corner. You go settings and then I believe it's audience and it pumps out when your audience is online. So in the case of my business, my audience is online at 6 PM. So so long as I get my content out before six, my people see it. So the best, I can give you stats on, um, you know, and I've written a social media ebook which has this exact sort of information. You can get it for $22. It has the best time in Australia to post, but honestly, the best time to post is the best time for your channel. So I would encourage you to look at your own analytics rather than rely on any um, generalized statements of when, um, when people are online because you want to be active for your community as well. Does anyone else have any, any other questions? Probably got time for one one more goodie if someone's got a tough one they wanna they wanna throw at me. I think Hannah, just while we're uh, waiting for uh, everyone online to think through that that tough question for you, um, really important points that have been raised today around just the framework that people need to to operate in, understanding that. The, the business environment will change, but there is a lot of opportunities out there as well and, and about how people can adapt and really take advantage of the new audience, the way people are wanting to travel and think through just how they could, um, I suppose, reorientate their experience or their offer to that audience. And, and certainly, um, again, the latest research that we're seeing is very much in line with some of those questions that came through around really collaborating. I think that's the, the really important point is, it's about working with other businesses in your destination, in your region. Um, it's no different for us. We're trying to work with all our destinations and, and showcase the Murray um, destinations that are, or businesses at a local level really working together to make sure that they're offering something that everyone can um, really put out in a collective manner and really support each other. So some really good points um, through today. We've just got one last question just before we perhaps sign off is everyone seems to think Canva's easy, but I don't find it that easy. I completely agree with you. I find it really difficult as well. Um, I think the thing why people like Canva and why people say it's easy is they mistake easy with cheap or easy with free. Um, I don't think it's easy, um, but I do think it's free. And the next sort of the other option is, like you said, you're using PowerPoint slides, but a lot of people don't have the, you know, even Microsoft Office, that's still a paid platform. Um, the best one to create any social media tiles on is Photoshop. But again, it's a paid platform. It's $33 a month and people just don't, people don't pay it. And Photoshop's hard too. So um, I think the, the Canva is just a tool that's, that's free and it's cheap. And so that is why people think it's easy, but I don't think it's, I don't think it's that easy. Um, it's certainly easier than Photoshop, but it's it, uh, it's not necessarily the easiest platform. So I, I absolutely hear you on it. Um, and thank you. I'm glad you've enjoyed Huff dollar sign 5245. <laughs> I'm glad you've enjoyed these sessions. So, well, it's 12.55 if anyone's like, please, we've got time maybe for one. Oh, we've got one more. Janelle, when can we expect to see something from MRT regarding what marketing is planned 
Um, I would, I don't want to speak, maybe Mark, if you want to say that, I would say in the next couple of weeks we'll be, we'll have something in market for sure, live. We've currently got acquisition live for the Murray River Tourism, which was always our phase zero approach. So um, if you remember back to the um, first uh, webinar, I said what our intention to do is move people down this funnel. So the first way to move them down the funnel is to have more people to talk to. So um, we've been working on an acquisition campaign for the Murray River Facebook page. It's grown um, more than 600%, which is fantastic. So um, it's it's really moved um, and that's in the last couple of weeks. So we're sort of, we've, we built this audience bank to now go live with the messaging. So um, we will have something because obviously time is of the essence. We had that one June um, date that everyone's now moving towards. Um, importantly, all of those campaigns that I showed you only got put out in the last uh, day. Uh, so they're not, the people have not been in market before us or for a long time. Um, everyone has gone live as of this week. So we won't be, we won't be playing catch up. We will be moving very, very quickly on this. And that's sort of what we've designed the campaign around is what can be executed quickly, efficiently, but inclusively. And I think that's the, the storytelling that we have to do here for the Murray River is we have to market collectively and never, it's never been more important because we have to build consideration for people to visit the Murray. Uh, and once we've built that consideration, then we can drive down direct to operators. So that's that's how the campaign's been built with that that in in mind. So um, from a, a time frame perspective, the answer is ASAP. Um, but we are very very aware that time is of the essence. So um, my team are working very hard on that at the moment. Thanks, Hannah. And I suppose to take that a step further, we've obviously been working really hard with both um, the state tourism agencies as well. So with Destination New South Wales, Visit Victoria, um, all the way through up into Tourism Australia. So there's a, a staged approach. We've actually developed a plan for the next 12 months around um, a range of activities. Um, it's really around now the rollout and the timing of um, how that uh, comes to life, I suppose, within the the situation as it's evolving. So as Hannah touched on, the next uh, week to two weeks, we'll definitely have um, this initial phase in place. We've got a number of avenues we've been working through um, with some augmented reality and virtual reality programs that are continue to be um, ramped up uh, and then seeing that sort of gradual um, step process. One of the, the key challenges that's, um, that's really coming out is around not putting um, what I classify as a sugar hit. So everything going at once, um, because we just don't know what sort of scale uh, we could be scaled back. It's not a linear approach. We're not coming out of COVID in a linear way. We could move up and down a scale from some sort of um, open to close regime. And we really need to make sure that we've got a plan in place that can be nimble and agile and adjust as that occurs. So um, we've certainly um, got some plans, some some partnership opportunities came out yesterday from Destination New South Wales. We know Visit Victoria are not very far behind as well um, from having theirs uh, opportunities released. So we'll have a, um, a good program and we've certainly got some longer term processes we've been working with each of our um, destination partners around looking forward over the next 12 months. Perfect. Well, that's the end of our, our questions. Um, so we're right on, right on time from where I'm sitting. So thank you so much, everyone, for joining for the last um, three, three fortnights, the three webinars. It's very generous of you to spend your lunch times with us. Um, as always, we'll send um, Donna will be sending out a copy of the slides and also the recording um, as well. Um, and you know where obviously Donna and Mark are if you've got any questions. And my my contact details are on the last slide as well. So if you have any direct follow up as well. And thank you, uh, Hannah, again. Thank you so much for, um, for creating this program for us. It was an idea we had. Um, we saw there was a gap in the market and Hannah's done a really good job at quickly pulling everything together. Some really good tools um, and really valuable insights for the industry. Um, and again, as Hannah mentioned, we really do thank all of our industry for taking the time. Um, the, the benefits that you invest in yourself now will definitely flow through as we um, work out our recovery and, and start to get back to hopefully some, uh, some welcoming visitors and, and growing the region again. So I really do thank you all for uh, participating. There's been some great feedback and Hannah, thank you so much for no uh, pulling this together again. Thank you so much.